Hi, this is Howard Fishman, coach, writer, and advocate for boomers. I want to welcome you to this five episode presentation on shifting your career focus in an upside down workplace. This first episode entitled taking stock of where you are today with your career will start the conversation with an examination of the state of today's workplace. It's important to remember that the workplace was volatile before the pandemic. In fact, if you were over the age of 50, you were already at a crossroads because of frequent layoffs and the impact on our generation because of ageism. In the post-pandemic phase, there's no way to know what comes next, but we could make an educated guess that our work lives will be even less secure. While businesses won't necessarily reshuffle their value propositions, they will adopt new business models, and they'll need to sculpt their employee base to match existing talent to that new model. That's where the jeopardy lies for us. If you're 50 plus, you're either trying to sustain yourself in the workplace or find new employment until you're ready to retire. Or you might be working towards some sort of hybrid retirement. Whatever the case, you're looking for proactive steps to make your situation better. And that's pretty much the message of this series of five episodes. Because keeping our edge has never been more important. It is we who must define our purpose and trajectory at this often unwieldy moment in our lives. Just how we do that is the burning question. So let's get into it. We'll begin by looking at some stark facts. These are the results compiled from recent studies by ProPublica and Urban Institute, two respected organizations that exemplify investigative journalism and economic and policy research respectively. Here are the worrisome stats. 28% of workers over 50 with full-time long-term jobs will be laid off at least once prior to planned retirement. An additional 13% retire under conditions that suggest they were edged out of the workplace. 15% more leave the workplace based on deteriorating job conditions, diminished pay, or worsening treatment by supervisors. Only 10% of those laid off will ever make as much in a new job if they can even find one. 55% of retirees say their retirement was forced or partially forced. Now let that sink in for a moment. Then consider that the stigma surrounding loss of work does not always allow for honest reporting by those who are impacted. Thus, the percentages above are most likely low. Let's take a look at the situation using real numbers. According to the US Census Bureau, there are currently 40 million Americans aged 50 and older still in the workforce. 22 million will be impacted by the statistics previously mentioned. Only 2 million will recover financially. Barron's Magazine calls this a slow motion disaster, especially for boomers who need a steady income. Here are the pressures impacting those statistics. C-suite members remain under the gun to provide constant value to shareholders. Older workers are frequently laid off in order to reduce costs, boost profits, and compete more effectively in a marketplace filled with younger faces. And here's the opposing view. It is said that boomers share some of the cause for this less than optimum situation. Inc. Magazine cites these five reasons. Companies need affordable specialists, not expensive generalists. Boomers complain too much about younger workers. They've forgotten they were once inexperienced themselves. The pressures impacting boomers, like lack of retirement dollars, aging parents, health issues, make it difficult for boomers to manage emotions in the workplace. And the older generation is disrupting the workforce with that, I've already paid my dues attitude, antagonistic to young colleagues. I think this is an absolutely lopsided view. I have seen some entitlement issues on the part of boomers in the workplace, but I've mostly seen ageist attitudes and a refusal by companies to provide training, support, and transparency. And yes, things are changing, but I think it's too little too late. The Business Roundtable, an association of CEOs from leading companies, took an important step at reinventing corporate leadership. They literally changed the definition of the purpose of a corporation. For the first time, the organization is stating, 
that employees will be considered stakeholders, along with shareholders, communities, and the environment. They specifically mentioned competitive wages and benefits, training and skill enrichment to adult workers. Specifics were not included, but the statement itself is a sea change. That being said, I can imagine this taking root in the very near future. In ageism, the source of much of the ignorance surrounding support for boomers is not likely to abate. After all, there's no Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter movement for elder adults. In essence, there will be no knight on a horseback to rescue us from the situation we face. So as I mentioned earlier, we will be responsible for the change we need to see in ourselves in order to survive this. We need to move ourselves into a different direction at a point in our lives when we thought we'd be coasting into retirement. I'm reminded of the quote attributed to Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. He said that if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. I'm also highly influenced by Socrates' statement, an unexamined life is not worth living. So the truth is, we have to do some soul searching, decide on a new destination, then understand all the parts of the journey. When working with my coaching clients, I get right down to the basics. It's important first to take a look back and understand how we built our current persona in the business world. We need to remember our biggest influences. Think about the wisdom we've gained from all of our experiences, the good, the bad, how we've modulated our careers during times of great change, what propelled us to success, what kept us from our goals. Without this type of honest evaluation, the question of where do we go next will be difficult to answer. The truth is we shouldn't be asking ourselves, can I hold on to my job? Because the right question is, am I worth keeping? Because none of us want to be a statistic. It's not time to rest on our laurels or be satisfied with our current performance. We need to drill deeper. I've developed six questions for a recent article I wrote, which takes a look at an employment longevity. These are tough but necessary questions that might point us in the right direction. The first question is this, in addition to performance, what are my unique contributions to the company? If we accept that we're hitting all of our marks on performance expectations, what are the extra unique contributions we can make to the company? Contributions that demonstrate we're part of the team working hard to make the company, not just ourselves, more successful. Number two, based on the current business environment, are those contributions enough to keep me employed? Do they represent me as someone with a finger on the pulse? Do I offer ideas and support relevant to the company's mission statement? Do my activities contribute to the bottom line? Which is why I ask this next question. Does my manager agree these contributions are critical additions to my portfolio? In fact, does his manager think so? In other words, is there a consensus by those who control my destiny that my performance plus the extra work I do toward the betterment of the company is recognized and valued? A response to this next question can be more difficult to gauge, but it's important to take a hard look at it. This is the question. Can I believe what my CEO says about the company's future, my future? Well, the answer lies in a clear-minded evaluation of your company's past actions to volatility, how it's reorganized itself around changes in the marketplace or changes in the economy overall, how it's stuck to the company's stated values, how it treated employees during those times. Here's number five. How can I make it easier for my boss to be frank with me about the new normal? This is primarily about building trust, being circumspect and measured in your everyday dealings with management, showing care for the overall good, not just your job status. Lastly, how do I become a member of the protected class? The answer to this lies in knowing the answers to all the previous questions. I'm going to talk a fair amount about authenticity during these episodes because it's paramount in setting the stage for your unique place at work. The definition of authenticity is this, not false or copied, genuine, real, representing one's true nature and beliefs. Some of us have lost our way with authenticity in the work setting, but claiming or reclaiming your authenticity is paramount to any type of personal turnaround. 
It's about separating yourself from the pack, creating a gravity around yourself that causes colleagues and managers to look at you in a more important light. Now, I want to stress that you don't have to be perfect to get where you want to go. You don't have to make noise around your accomplishments or frequently point out your loyalty to the company. This is a quiet thing. It isn't just corporate speak or hyperbole. It's about quietly brushing yourself off and polishing yourself up so that you shine at this moment in time. And I want to help you make that obvious. I'm actually asking you to put yourself, your wisdom, your experience into a masterclass category. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the Cambridge Dictionary defines a masterclass as a class taught by someone who has an expert knowledge or skill in a particular area. Isn't that you? Haven't you earned the title of master by your longevity and experience? I'm not asking you to teach a masterclass. I'm asking you to believe you're a master. Find the center of your gravity, your gravitas. Close your eyes and imagine the confidence this would give you if you did. The license to speak in your own voice and be heard. The ability to influence those around you. Oprah Winfrey has a long running masterclass program on television. Her definition of a master is deeply profound. She says that a master is someone who has fully stepped in and owned the full progress and trajectory of their life. And that's essentially what I'm asking you to do. Let's listen as she explains. My intention in creating Masterclass came from the understanding that everybody's story is the same, all stories are connected, and there is nothing that anyone who's living on Earth has ever felt or known or experienced on a soul level that hasn't been felt or known or experienced by someone else. One of the most difficult things in life is feeling that you are the only one. You are the only one who's traveled this path, who's felt this way. I had nowhere to go. I was homeless at the time. I lost my family. Next thing I know, I'm in this car for three years, man. I'm struggling. Who's experienced such devastation or joy or triumph or victory. So for me, I define a master as someone who has fully stepped in and owned the full progress and trajectory of their life. Persistence pays off. That's lesson one. But hearing stories told from the mouths of people who know how to live, how to course correct, how to keep going, how to never quit, how to rejoice in the good times and have faith in the bad, those people are masters. Anyone who can do that is a master. And their ability to share their stories only helps the trajectory of others who listen. Do you see yourself in any of this? Not all of us will automatically feel comfortable assuming master status, but Oprah brings focus to it in a way that's very human, very achievable. Now, another way to look at this, and I'm sure you've heard this expression, is to find your true north. The public broadcasting system in the US defines true north this way. It's the internal compass that guides you successfully through life. It represents who you are as a human being at your deepest level. It's your fixed point in a spinning world. That's the best definition of true north I've seen, and it's exactly what I've been talking about, because your true north is your authenticity. Okay, let's take a breath. This is a lot to think about. As you move through the next four episodes, I'll give you tools, knowledge, and confidence to support the journey toward finding your true north. Thanks very much. I'll see you in episode two, tapping into the source of insight-driven clarity, intellect, and purpose.